So, this one has been a long time coming. For those of you that keep up on my book reviews, you may be wondering why it took me so long to get to this book. Well, the main reason for that is... I didn't like it. And on top of that, these book reviews are often a grueling and draining experience. Because there's just so many times I trip over my words or mean to say something else, I have to edit in what I meant to say, and this book just didn't seem worth it for the longest time. That, and I was getting it mixed up with my original Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I thought I already reviewed it, but uh, no, I did not. So, let's, uh, let's just jump into this, I guess. I'm going to take it slow because I do not want to devote a lot of time to editing this. So after the adventure on the Planet Making Planet, Zepho decides to take the gang to a place known as the Restaurant at the End of the Universe. This task has to be put on hold, though, as the Vulgans are there. So, it turns out them destroying the Earth was no accident. They were hired by the psychologists of the universe, seeing that the answer to life, the universe, and everything would definitely take away their business. So the Vogans were hired to take care of Earth. And now, they've spotted the last Earth creature that could potentially give this answer. They attack the Heart of Gold, and it seems like all hope is lost when Zapho just loses his mind and says, you know what, let's have a seance. Crazy enough, it works, and it summons Zaphod's grandfather. He's able to protect the ship, however, Zaphod and Marvin are sent to the very planet that publishes The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There, they enjoy the sunshine, but they wonder where the rest went. Before parting, the grandfather said to talk to the CEO of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He attempts to do so, but the person at the front desk is not very cooperative, but he is able to sneak his way up there. On the way, he is chased down by law enforcement, still a fugitive for stealing the heart of gold in the first place, after all. And so there is an attack by a killer robot. Marvin sacrifices himself so that Zaphod can be free. Once again, there is another voice. Jump into the left window. Which he does. However, this ends up putting him on a desolate planet that is used for torture. Essentially, there is a room in it that shows the entire vastness of the universe and in doing so has made people go insane. The Executioner is a rather odd fellow, as he has a voice and a body, but the body is off partying while the voice is still calling to him. So, Zaphod goes into the very room, and it turns out it has no effect on him, to which the voice is just like, what? Most people would crack up at something like this. But... Zaphod is perfectly fine, and so starts to walk around the rest of the abandoned planet, where they run into one of the most disturbing things that this book series has set up to this point. It is an old-fashioned spaceship full of hundreds of passengers that are stuck in suspended animation. They didn't get the napkins they required, and so they are just strapped to the seats, and they are woken up every 10 years to have a cup of coffee. By the time the coffee is done, they lose consciousness again, and they are unable to get out. Zaphod finds the ship, and the stewardess even tries to shove him into one of the seats for eternity like the rest. However, he's able to get out, and behind him is the publisher of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Inside of his pocket is the Heart of Gold. For some odd reason, it got shrunk down. They talk for a little bit, and the ship goes back to normal size, and so the gang goes back to the restaurant at the end of the universe. Now, this is a bit of a twist. The reason it's called the restaurant at the end of the universe is 
not so much because of its location, but because of its point in time. It is the end of time that everybody at the restaurant is able to go for. And due to their layaway program, you just kind of pay like two cents. And by the time it is the end of the universe, that'll come to like $500 billion. So that's more than ample to be able to pay for anybody that goes there. Zephode runs into an old friend, a heavy rocker, whose concerts are so powerful that audiences have to be on another planet behind a super secret bomb shelter in order to listen to them without dying. However, this rocker is legally dead, so he can't really speak to him. All this is portrayed to him by his bodyguard, which is just kind of watching over things. After a lovely meal, the group descend into the parking garage, where Marvin is found alive. Apparently he had been parking cars for the past 10,000 years. <laughs> and obviously that hasn't done a whole lot to improve his sarcastic tone. Before leaving, before leaving, the group spots the rocker's souped-up spacecraft. Ford and Arthur decide to take it for a ride. However, the thing was programmed for a collision course with the sun to end one of the big rocker's concert. Luckily for them, there was a teleporter installed into the thing, even though it was just meant to be autopilot the whole time. And what the teleporter does, it gets them out of the spaceship, but it transports them to this other one where it's just full of cryogenically frozen coffins. Yeah, there's honestly a lot of disturbing imagery in this one. Upon each one, it says what their occupation is. Such as the phone cleaner. A lone guard spots them and then takes them up to the bridge, where they see the captain enjoying a nice bath. From the tub, the captain is able to describe their story. Basically, their planet was doomed, and they have to go to this other planet to be able to continue their race. So they crash on this planet, only to realize that they were a defective race that the other planet just wanted to get rid of. However, an infection from an improperly washed phone is what ends up dooming that race. And so where did this other one end up? In the beginning of Earth itself. There are some inhabitants there already, but unfortunately the defective race and all their diseases is slowly killing off the superior beings. And along the way, Ford and Arthur are just trying their best to get off of this thing and back to their current time. And that's basically it. At the very end of the book, it said, you want to see what happens to Arthur and Ford? Join us next time in the next book. And to me, I just gave it a hard no. I had a very hard time getting through this. I can't really get vested in a story that doesn't have any boundaries. I mean, it doesn't seem like people die. There's some sort of mystical thing that makes it so that really can't happen. A universe without rules is not interesting. There's no consequences. These characters can do whatever they want and oh look they cheated death because some space wizard decided to take pity on them. How? I can't get vested in this and on top of that I'm there for the story and it's just all over the place. And we get the idea that like the universe is expansive. There's a whole bunch of different races and different people, different theologies. But yet it doesn't really explore any of that. It's just kind of like, oh, look at these people and their crazy shenanigans. I need more structure than this. And so, yeah, that's really the main reason I haven't done this review. So after the disappointment of that, I started going back to some of the James Bond books. Mostly because there were a few other modders out there that that were interested in trying to make golden eye mods out of both of these movies. I figured I would read them, and if they wanted the details of the story, they could have it. And on top of that, I remember having a lot of fun with Moonraker. But after Moonraker, 
I decided to go for The Godfather. I picked this one up in a bargain bin, and you can tell it's in really rough shape. I like the stained pieces, the idea it's peeling away here and there. And I think it's more fitting because it's kind of a story about the more blunt and at times even disturbing nature of the human condition. And here's probably one of the fun things is I think everybody knows that The Godfather was a movie, but it was a book first. And I have the proof right here. Soon to be a major motion picture by Paramount. Now, I haven't seen the movie, and the main reason I wanted to read the book is because, well, it's a little easier for me to just kind of skip through the more graphic sections, and oh boy, there's definitely a reason this was made into an R-rated movie. Like, even the book, it's very like, whoa, you're going pretty far there. But... I guess after that one guy wrote The Tropic of Cancer, I feel like you could get away with a lot more. It's kind of funny how I remember hearing Catcher in the Rye was rather shocking when it first came out because, well, it dropped a few F-words. This one drops a lot of them, as well as some racial insensitivity. But I don't want to go too crazy into this. I'm going to make a whole book review of this. As you can see, I've still got a little ways to go. I hope you will join me then. Until next time, keep having fun.